Hi, welcome. I am Lynn Gumpert. I'm director of The Gray, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight, or whatever time you're listening in at. Um, behind the scenes at The Gray, Joseph Burwell and Ruben Lorch Miller. This is part of a series that we're hosting online called Behind the Scenes at The Gray. And um, as you might know, uh, the gray is actually closed to the public at the moment. And this is not because of COVID-19 um, exactly. It's because we had always planned to be closed to do some updates to our facilities. And it's just coincided with um, the virus and, and the shutdown. And like a lot of our colleagues, um, we've taken the opportunity to increase our programming um, online and to try and get um, more video features and more updates to what we can share with our audiences about our collection and the museum. And we have active intern program who are doing blog posts. So I hope you will check out some of our other programs. Uh, before we begin, a uh, word about today's programs that will last for about an hour or so. And in the end, I will um, pose questions to the speakers. Uh, I also encourage you to submit questions as well anytime during the program by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We've turned off the chat feature for tonight but feel free to send comments through the Q&A too. Um, the program is being recorded and will be posted on the Gray's website with closed captions in the future. So again, also before we begin, I wanna thank my colleagues at the Gray, uh, Richard Wager and Noah Landfield, um, our um, in-house um, crew, as well as Lucy Oakley, head of education and Eric, Arisic, who is uh, overseeing and producing this program. I'm also greatly indebted to Michelle Wong, the Associate Director of the Gray and Head of Collections and Exhibitions. So uh, we kind of informally began uh, this series of behind the scenes um, at the Gray with a interview that was conducted with Michelle Wong. Um, and again, you can see that on our website. And um, apropos to this evening's discussion, Michelle started out as an art handler and front desk attendant. She also made signage. Um, and um, I think she, she was greatly uh, encouraged the, the possibility and the um, opportunity to talk further with some of the artists that we've worked with over the years. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to our friends at the Block Museum at Northwestern, with whom we collaborate a lot, and who have also had an online feature on their um, preparators and art handlers. So we, um, I first met both artists, um, Joseph and Ruben, um, as they've been uh, team members, part of our crew to install exhibitions. So I've gotten to know them over the years, and I'm personally very excited to see more about their artwork, um, their main purpose in life. Um, and I'm sure most of you know that there's a long history also of artists working day jobs. So um, I checked out a few. Jeff Coons uh, worked at the membership desk at MoMA for many years, as well as a Wall Street commodities broker. Uh, Richard Serra uh, was a furniture mover. Um, Mark Rothko, an elementary school teacher. Ai Weiwei apparently earned money as a blackjack player. That was something I did not know. And of course, there are um, artists like Barbara Kruger, who worked as a graphic designer at Condé Nast. And in her case, um, her day job um, obviously impacted her artwork. Um, I think more than we'll see uh, in today's artists. So I'm really pleased to welcome both Joseph Burwell and Ruben Lorch Miller tonight. And I'm going to introduce them, um, both of them at the same time. And then the, each artist is going to 
make a presentation briefly about their work. And from there, uh, we'll go into a point where we'll be, uh, I'll be asking questions, we'll have a discussion, and then move on to questions um, from the audience. So Joseph um, Burwell was born in Iceland, something I did not know previous to tonight, and grew up in Virginia. He studied architecture at Savannah College of Art and Design and received his BA in Studio Arts from the College of Charleston in South Carolina. A multidisciplinary artist, he has an MFA in sculpture from Tulane University and recently earned a second MFA in painting from Hunter College. Uh, Joseph has had residencies at Cooper Union and PS122 Project Studio Program and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's Workspace Program, among others. He currently teaches at Pratt Institute and exhibits his work with Miyako Yoshinaga in New York and ADA Gallery in Richmond, Virginia. Ruben Lorch Miller was raised in the Pacific Northwest, where he is currently at the moment, but lives and works primarily out of Brooklyn. He studied at Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, and later earned an MFA in new genres from San Francisco State University. He's been a visiting artist and lecturer at Illinois State University, at RISD, Stanford University, the San Francisco Art Institute, and Pratt Institute. Ruben recently completed nine months of training at New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care, and his work is in the collections of MoMA, the Tacoma Art Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Berkeley Art Museum, and the Brooklyn Museum of Art. So I'm welcome, I want to welcome Joseph, who will talk about his work. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. Um, and thank you to the Gray for this opportunity. I'm just going to share my screen. So uh, this is an installation that I did and that I made in 2018. Um, it's a the structure in this installation is like a, a hybrid space. It's part part stage, part museum, and part storage unit. But it's like it acts as a type of like cosmological model to help me organize sort of somewhat cluttered narratives that I've been forming in my head. Um, I'm working, I was working in, an, in like a bricolage kind of process to create a new version of like older myths. So I extracted core samples from various narrative sources and um, let them sit here and accumulate and kind of build meaning in their proximity to each other. Um, the corner structure was significant for me because the word corner doesn't really represent um, doesn't really represent a specific object like the tree like a tree represents a tree, but it um, corner contains like some magical properties. We don't really know where a corner ends, but a, you know a corner can continue as far as the materials allow it to continue. A corner is not an object; it's more of an event. With this idea and, and its potential for for um, infinite expansion, I the corner resembles like the the Big Bang uh, to me. So I thought that it would make a great like base structure for like any cosmological model. Uh, as, for the, as for the narrative, <clears throat> uh, it started as an updated or an updated version of uh, to existing creation myths. One's, one that was maybe like less anthropocentric and more biocentric. One that uh, synthesized various myths, was infused with like, an, was infused with more like um, recent scientific understanding. Um, it really kind of came out of this, I, this question, like what if like the fallen angels from John Milton's uh, Paradise Lost were replaced with single celled organisms, you know, or the building blocks of life that scientists uh, suspect may have arrived on earth via meteor, meteors. Um, we know how influential bacteria is on our bodies and our health and even our mood and our behavior. Um, and we've classified bacteria in our bodies as good bacteria and bad bacteria. Um, could we blame these like behaviors on, our, on these ancient life forms? That was one question I was pursuing. Um, so I attempted to follow this narrative by creating artifacts uh, that contain, to contain these kind of narrative units. Instead of clarifying 
the narrative, it just seemed to get messier and messier, spawning new narratives that would grow outward and into new directions, sometimes reconnecting like a, like a creeping plant, you know, touching the ground and, and sometimes not. Uh, this is a detail of the inside of that corner. Um, the mountain range that's, that you see there is, is a photograph of a formation in, in Greece called Thea Petra. Um, a cave was found there in Thea Petra where it was believed that the first human made wall was built out of stacked rocks about 23,000 years ago um, to block the winds of the ice age that were coming in. Um, so this was an origins, this was the origin story of, of architecture and, but the unexpected like residual effect was that the first corner was also created at that time. So the first architect was somewhat of a, sh a shaman. The forms on the right are made, those, those um, stone looking forms are made out of plasticine. Plasticine is, is a non-hardening clay, but it can be formed to, um, it can be formed to resemble stone as, I, as I've done here. If you look, if it can learn to speak like the language of like duration and civilization. Um, there's something interesting in the wordplay involved here too. Um, the Pleistocene is a scientific name for the ice age and the ice age is and the Stone Age coincide almost perfectly. So they're, they're kind of like crystallized colleagues. This is, the this is an image of the back of the structure. Um, being on sawhorses was, I think, kind of get, was important to giving the feeling of like the model being, under, feeling like it was still under construction. Uh, another image of the back, I wanted to have the effect of being behind the set, you know, being behind the set of the production, witnessing what, something that was not intended to be seen. I wanted to confuse what was being presented with what was being stored for like later configurations. I'm sure I was influenced by the open storage rooms at the American wing of the Met. Um, it's a place where when I go there as a viewer, I feel like a, an invited intruder. This grouping here uh, houses several objects. The two panels on the top are images of dirt burned into wood. And on the bottom rack, there's a yard of heat resistant silicone. And the plexiglass sign there, if you can see it, um, I don't know if you can read it, but it says tender orchestra music. I was, I, I oftentimes watch, watch movies and films with the subtitles on and, and, I, and I collect, I collect um, um, subtitles that are, that have descriptions of sounds, uh, usually in parentheses and music. And um, this one can be reserved for like maybe sweeter moments. <laughs> this was an, uh, a section, this whole section was broke off and became like uh, its own module later in a later exhibition. Um, on one level was kind of like an isolated conversation about heat, but at the same time, it's also like an underlying character study of a larger creation myth. I'll zoom in on the next slide where you can see some of the, talk about how some of these individual panels were made. I started experimenting with laser cutter uh, because it can be used for engraving as well as cutting. I wanted to make some close up images of dirt that, uh, that abstracted the forms. Um, dirt, you know, taking an important role in the narratives I was developing as both an, it was both an actor and a location. It was like the setting and the subject. Um, it's, tr it's a transformative material and it's neutral, not because of inaction, but because but because it can participate in like balancing uh, extreme actions. Dirt is like the default realm of all earthly matter. And in the beginning, it's the beginning and it's the end of like all life forms. So it doesn't matter what nation sits on top of it. It's like life and death are not the same. Um, I mean, are the same to dirt and truth and fiction are the same too. It's the charged, in my narrative that I was constructing, it was like the charged, the charged atmosphere of the, of the underworld. Um, and home to the phonic like beings that dwell there. I wanted to redefine the underworld in more pedestrian terms, the rocks, the earthworms, the snakes, and the bacteria that live there being like the prosaic uh, deities of the, in this version. Children play with dirt, you know, for the same reason that vampires sleep in it. Um, our, ancestors, our ancestors hide there. Uh, meaning like the uh, micro, um, the uh, bacteria and, and, what, and the single cell organisms that we came from. Uh, one of the rules of vampire literature is that it, 
a vampire is busting the dirt of its homeland every night. In theory, this soil sample would contain like an original spectrum of microbes that was, ex it was exposed to as a child. Bacteria is important not only for our digestive systems, but also for our immune systems. Um, doctors tell parents to, play, to let their children play in the dirt. You know, could it be that vampires are not immortal, but that they just have really extraordinary immune systems? Temples have been uh, you know, erected to worship dirt's constant state of flux. Walter de, de Maria and Robert Smithson's, I consider to be the high priests. Um, here's an image of some of the uh, classic uh, underworld characters and deities. Here's the first Lord of the Underworld. Um, these images were made by using laser engraver, to, a laser cutter to engrave through a painted ground. So the result was kind of a phantasmagoric presence. The rock is both like real, it's both real and less real in it, than the environment. You know, it has a, a realistic texture and perspective that contradicts the isometric background, but also a ghost-like luminosity um, and transparency. Because rocks were our first technology, I like to think of them as like the forbidden fruit that initiated like a, uh, a certain trajectory of knowledge. Um, they're ancient beings and they rule the pedosphere through sheer durability. This is the second intermediate lord. After making about 20 lords of the underworld, uh, I've started using volcanic rocks um, and they're classified as intermediate rocks and this kind of suggested layers of lesser and minor deities within, within the pantheon. Um, another phonic being is new, of this new pedestrian underworld is a snake. I like to use the snake instead of serpent because it has like a less magical flavor to it. Um, and I looked at images of St. Patrick expelling the snake from Ireland because it was a, kind of a reenactment of another narrative, that of, that of like God casting out Satan out of heaven. And um, so I wanted to have my own tangled version. Um, next to last slide here is my architecture sign. It has a 2001 kind of space odyssey vibe, two proto-humans contemplating a piece of lumber. This was influenced by the Via Petra cave that I showed you in the earlier. And it reminds me of how we construct the world through objects and how it's our nature to, uh, to build. And this is my sign of the apocalypse. Every story has a beginning, every story has an end. No origin myth is complete without its apocalypse fantasies. The reigning of fire and brimstone is a popular scenario. All right, thank you, that's it. Thanks Joseph for going first. <laughs> Thanks for everyone for thanks to everyone for coming. Um, thank you to the Gray Gallery for organizing this and inviting me. And um, it's really interesting to see Joseph's artwork um, and see where we overlap and have things in common and, and points of interest. Um, so before, as we look at this artwork, I'm going to just hold it on this one image to start out with, and just talk about three themes or concepts or approaches. Um, that I want to mention to bring some context to how I work as an artist, <clears throat> excuse me, and the examples I'm going to show. So one, uh, the first one is artifacts. And I'm really interested in the idea of artworks as artifacts and artifacts as artworks. Uh, an artwork, any object or image really, is a record of its making. The qualities of its form and the results of its creation. The, fa the, the factors the means and the conditions that go into its creation are ultimately embedded in the results. Uh, these can be the materials and the process as well as the intent and attitude. And the location and the time and then also the resources available are part of this equation also. Um, and all of these factors contribute to the form and the qualities and the meaning of the work. So the, the object itself or the image itself is an artifact of this whole process. And the second is found objects. And the idea of artifacts and found objects are very closely related. And um, I'll show you some photography as well as sculpture. And I also include my photography in this category of found objects. Um, the photographs are of things that I come across. Spaces, architectural spaces, locations, and objects that I find and then collect by using a camera. And so I collaborate with found objects in one way or another. Um, and there are also found ob objects in my work that are fiction. So I make things that might look like a found object or blend in or collaborate with found other found objects. And I like to blur the lines between what I make and what I find. So ultimately when I make an artwork, as soon as it's finished, 
it becomes a new found object to collaborate with. So a lot of times I feel like I'm making my own found objects. And then the third factor, or third kind of concept is modularity. And so I often make projects that have modular systems that are interchangeable or have a set of parts or a set of units. And these can be moved around and recombined in different ways. Uh, sometimes I'll duplicate or rescale images and objects and these will show up in different artworks over time and over projects. Sometimes I'll make sculptures that are made out of parts that can be assembled and taken apart, reassembled and changed. And when the images and the sculptures are not fixed uh, in a permanent form, everything is flexible and adaptable. So this is uh, from 2015 and this is a red, red modular sculpture and it's about 20 inches tall and it's painted wood. And this is made with a set of slotted squares, wooden squares that I painted, and they can be taken apart and this can be reformed in, in any different way. Um, so this is actually just a photograph of, of it in this formation, and this isn't what it looks like anymore right now. Um, let's see what's going on. Hmm. Oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, so this is a black and white modular sculpture and it's 13 and a half inches tall and it's painted wood as well. And it's set up in the exact same way as the red modular sculpture, but it's three quarters of a scale, uh, three quarters scale of that sculpture. And this is a photograph uh, printed as a photocopy and I've used photocopying for a long time as a printmaking technique. Uh, and this is called time and it's uh, printed at uh, 30 inches tall by 22 inches wide. This is uh, another photograph printed in, as a large photocopy called Space. Again, 30 inches tall, 22 inches wide. And then I'm gonna show a few examples from a larger series of uh, collages. And these are also made with photocopies, but instead of a, a large printed photocopy. Everything that you see here is made out of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. So that's standard pieces of paper, piece of paper. So the background is an original, original photograph and then it's printed in parts and then reassembled to make a larger photograph. So these are the scale of these are 36 inches tall and 27 inches wide. And then the color uh, flyers that you see on there are actually eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper to give you a sense of scale. So these are made with found flyers, recreated flyers, and other images. So another one. And you see in the center in the, on the blue, that's that black and white sculpture showing up again, but now as a photograph, which it actually was before. And then some of these have these QR codes, which you can see when in the lower right hand corner that uh, link to other content. And then I was doing a residency as a visiting artist and teacher at a university in Illinois. And I found a stack of these old um, writing tablets that were used at some time in a lecture hall. And there was like, I collected 50 of them. There were more of them and they were being thrown away. And they seem like they've been locked in a closet for like the last 20 years. And um, they're just covered in this graffiti that students, students at the university did. So I collected these, I was just fascinated by these and I kept them and I wasn't sure what to do with them, but I knew I needed to keep them. So this is an exhibition from last year and uh, I made, ended up making a modular sculpture with those um, writing panels. Uh, those writing panels, I had 50 of them and they're uh, 19 by 12, so 19 inches long, 12 inches wide. And I, I had 50 of those, and then I made 50 more using a, a wood, the same material, and then painted them different colors. And then each one of those got a slot cut in each side, so they each have four slots, and then they could be assembled into a sculpture. And then the sculpture is really malleable and the form can really change. And I was in a long, the gallery space is very long. So I was able to make the sculpture kind of collaborate with the space and fit the space. And then I had two photographs printed again as photocopies on either side. So there's the sculpture. 
And again, the sculpture is like, this isn't what this looks like now. That this just looked like this for this show. Collaborating with those found objects, duplicating those found objects, and then using a modularity. So an artifact, a series of, a set of artifacts that I found, and then a new artifact that I made as a larger sculpture. So the, the sculpture itself is an artifact of the process of it being made. And then these are the photographs. Uh, again, these are printed on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. This photograph, the image, the final image, the final piece is 40, um, no, excuse me, the final piece is 36 inches tall by 27, which is the same proportions of eight and a half by 11. Um, but this is made out of a lot of eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper put together and it's black toner on fluorescent paper. And then this was the second photograph. Same scale, same process, um, same proportions, and but just it's black toner on white paper. So that's it for me. Thank you. So thank you both Joseph and Ruben. And um, as uh, Ruben intimated, I it's really fun to discover the fact that you guys have shared interests um, and overlaps. And one thing that struck me immediately, um, and I'd like you both to address it, is that you both have one kind of a, an affiliation with architectural um, forms. And um, I, I know that Joseph did study architecture, but Ruben, how did you come to architecture? I think I came, let's see, I think I came to architecture more uh, not formally through studying architecture, but more as a builder. <clears throat> um, being a carpenter, building out spaces, and um, yeah, that's sort of maybe more where I was influenced by that. I've made a lot of work that's sort of based on like putting square flat things together. <laughs> And, and Joseph, you've always just been interested, I assume, with architecture and thought about at one point, I'm assuming, becoming an architect? Yeah, yeah. When, uh, when I was about 13, I think I decided I wanted to be an architect and made, I made some drawings of like a giant house with a pool and a, and a, and a bowling alley. And, um, and then when I got, I went to um, art school for architecture and had all these roommates and there were... Um, painters and sculptors. And I took my first sculpture class and I, once they gave me a rivet gun, I really, really got into uh, drilling and, and putting rivets in something and, and that physical feeling of putting things together. It's that kind of strategy that you could uh, think about how to attach things was really, it was really, uh, really hit home, hit home with me. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting um, in both, um, you know, in both of your cases. I mean, another really similar strategy again, and this was totally uh, not planned, but is that you both have this kind of bricolage, bricoleur approach to finding things, using things, you know, in, in Ruben's case, the found objects and the dialogue. And in Joseph's case, you know, also the, um, just the, the, use, the use of various things that you come across in terms of industrial materials and then also Again, um, how did you, were you guys aware of this, each other? I know that you're friends and as well as colleagues. I don't think, I, I will, I'll speak for myself. I wasn't aware of it with quite the depth of like, oh, right. And I started thinking when I was putting together this presentation and then re kind of reflecting on what I've seen of Joseph's work, I started to like, oh, I think we're gonna have some, some crossover, which I was excited to see, yeah. Now it's nice when the serendipity happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't aware in, in, the, in any kind of depth either, but um, one thing you could always, you could, I could see in Ruben's work was this attraction towards like these modernist structures and modularity too, a lot of MOD words. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, this interchangeability of like forms and in my work, it, it it also applies to like the ideas or the narratives. They're all interchangeable too, you know, and, and putting the, as a way of build, building myths out of fragments of other myths. Yes, I noticed there is that narrative structure that again um, kind of uh, links your work together. Um, Joseph, I was I really like the dirty pictures um, and that sense of humor <laughs> that comes across also, or the 
play on words. Um, do you see humor as important to your work? Yeah, I, th I think probably humor and very and like balanced with a certain intensity of like like um, of seriousness or um, yeah, I think that they kind of work together. So that image, dirty pictures, looks very dark and it's very. I spent about eight hours at the laser cutter, like. I kept burning it in and burning it in and burning it in and trying to remove layers. And so it just kept getting more and more burned. And it looks really, you know, it's very death-like, but then it's uh, humorous at the same time. Yeah, and um, it's interesting to see that narrative, you know, again, cutting across centuries and eons and, you know, space traveling in a kind of a really interesting way. Do you look? Do you like science fiction, or is it more strictly the hi the history? Oh, I love science fiction. Yeah, you know, got a little bit of a sense yeah. of that, and I liked also the whimsy in North American data of the way in which the sculpture um, reaches out and embraces the column, um, and then you know plays again with that that ambiguous or that very specific yet you know um, universal sense of, of two two things meeting a corner. Right. You know, that, that kind of intersection. Um, and Ruben, those, those writing tablets are truly amazing. I can see why you felt an immediate, you know, um, sense of, wow, something has to come out of these. And it's really interesting to see how you were able to use them in that larger sculpture. Yeah, I, when I found them, I didn't know what I was going to do with them, but they just were too sweet to pass up. I mean, it did feel like it's sort of this like garbage archaeology or something like that. Um, that was just like, whoa. And, and for me, a part of them that made them so sort of resonant was like the amount of time that was compressed into those objects because there were points of reference from like, there's probably like 20 years of points of reference within these things. And so I just imagined them being like handed out every year and then like someone just contributes to them this is just that thing of like sometimes you'll see very old graffiti like layered on top of each other and you just think about that layering of time and that layering of like this individual effort so it's like a patina that could only be built up over time and those objects there's no way that you could re i mean you could i guess but they're so hard to try to duplicate because they're so inherent of their own making and again that's sort of one of the things that i was talking about so they're just resonant to me they're like these charged batteries or something well they're definitely charged i mean it is fascinating because yeah. you just you do immediately envision you know this notion of of mark making you know this very primitive graffiti of students yeah. sitting bored in classes yeah. um the tech the tactility of it and this kind of overall composition that is yeah. is really engaging and i think yeah. it really is um set off nicely by the um monochromatic um but brightly colored panels you know um, no, thanks yeah that that sets up a nice dialogue yeah and it was a question of when you have for me when i have something that's so charged it's like what am i going to do with these things like am i going to they're already sort of perfect <laughs> so then it's a then it's just a puzzle of like taking time and experimenting and seeing like am i going to make these worse or better well, I also both appreciated the fact that you were able to focus on one or two works that give you a sense of your direction, but not, you know, and to see the installations. And so I didn't catch the title of that piece with the writing tablets. Does that have a title? Yeah, that, the name of that sculpture is Samsara, which is like a long, a little bit of a longer story that I could kind of explain. Sure. Um, and where was, where was that exhibition? It looks beautiful. That's in a place in San Francisco. It's in a, a gallery that's in a basement underneath a laundromat. So, yeah. And so when I, and that place is very, it's probably like maybe like nine feet across by like 30 feet long. So it was very, um, uh, it's a challenging space or it, it, the space has a lot of content in and of itself. And so I wanted to show a sculpture, but I knew that that that's a hard place to show sculpture in. So what was I going to do? And then also I wanted to show a big sculpture, and and also um, how do you like shipping a big sculpture across the country was just seemed kind of ridiculous or beyond reasonable. And so that modularity was really great because that thing packs down into very small 
a few, just a few small boxes. That's great. No, yeah. it's, and yeah. it's easier to store. It's easier to store. There's a certain sustainability. Yeah. But the, t the title samsara is, uh, the samsara is a concept that comes uh, out of, it, it's in like Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain traditions. That's about this continuous wheel of existence. So it's this ongoing wheel of existence. It's like kind of the state that we're in. Um, and so I was thinking about, so sometimes that's, cons that's like well, where we're constantly in this sort of self-making. It's this constant wheel of self-making and there's a certain suffering involved in that. And so I was thinking of it in two ways, a lot of ways, but to keep it, the story simple, the, um, that sculpture, those, those panels, those panels that graffiti, to me there was something expressive in that graffiti about the people who, write, who were writing that of like, I exist. And there's this kind of self-making. And it's also the age, so it's like college students. So it's like late teens, early 20s, where there's this, all this self-making happening. And then also the, in that graffiti, it it's basically comes down to like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So it's like bands, stuff about drinking and like smoking weed, and then like just lewd. And so th there's that sort of like self-making too, that's very like simplistic. So we're back to Joseph's uh, dirty pictures. Exactly. <laughs> so then, so, so, that, so that was this idea of like this self-making and this constant cycle of self-making. Yeah. And then also the, the space that that show was in, when I talked about, so you start at one, you start at one point and you see that fluorescent orange photograph, which is this really expressive sort of figurative sculpture that's maybe this like younger, sort of that like explosive self-making and you walk and then there's this older tree with an older with a path that leads out of it and so the idea of like you can walk around in this circle so the uh, the space itself becomes this cyclical thing so if that's so if that, yeah that and a similar sense. question to joseph um the installation of north american data was very impressive where was where was that uh show taking place that show was at the hunter's uh, gallery in in tribeca um, and then I showed another, uh, some versions of the modules later, like since everything is, is kind of modular, they do, they can break off and start their own conversations and start their own narratives. And the dirty pictures console there became its own, uh, unit piece. later. Yeah. And, and then this Western piece became a Western module that was shown in a more intimate way, not on, not on the sawhorses, but on ground level with just the signage uh, to see how they, they spoke to each other. And, how, and have, have you made those in multiples? I mean, you speak of modular and you know, repetition mm. and obviously um, photography fa factors into your work as well. And so do some of those spin off and have you made them in multiples? No, I think I was maybe the form itself is a, is a modular and that it can be, they can be moved around and attached to each other in different ways and linked uh, in ways to find their own meaning. Uh, but I haven't made multiples of those. No, each one is sort of its own sign um, that I reuse over and over in different, in various installation, in various forms of that installation. Great. So do you guys have questions for each others? Well, I, uh, these aren't necessarily- or me. Sure. I mean, any, anybody. These aren't, these aren't necessarily questions, but they're just kind of things that I thought of while we were talking. Um, and we could just, you could choose whatever to respond to. One word that came up that I don't think that we talked about exactly that both Joseph and I said right off the top of our presentations was this idea of artifacts and sort of finding things like that, like, there's the difference between like a found object and an artifact, or maybe there is no difference. I'm not sure. And then I was also thinking about, um, this interest in architecture and how we're both, we both make sculptures in a lot of ways. It's like oversimplify it, but, or maybe it's true. Just well, like they're definitely three-dimensional. We're making sculptures, we're making three-dimensional mm -hmm. objects. So I, so for me, I was thinking about like an interest in architecture is like, if you're thinking sculpturally and you're thinking three-dimensionally, for me at least, like I'm often thinking about the object, but then how the object inhabits a space. So like, like a sculpture relies on the space that it's in. Mm -hmm. So thinking sort of for me, like thinking sculpturally is, it's not just the thing, but it's like, where is the thing embedded in space? So it's inevitable that you're going to take space into account and really consider that as like, that's part of the way you work as a sculptor. So anyway, those, those are some things, artifacts and space. <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> 
Joseph, any questions or comments? Uh, no, not really. Yeah, I mean, this idea of artifacts is, is very interesting that we're both working with a lot of found things, both concepts, both found concepts and found objects. And the objects kind of contain these concepts that can be packed up, you know, and moved around. So, you know, one other question I had for both of you is, um, you know, your day job as an art handler or preparator, has, ha has that impacted your work or um, do you keep the two, your art practice and your day job separate? It, it definitely impacts my work. It's become less of my day job than it has in the past. Um, I do a lot more teaching right now too and that definitely impacts my work as well. Working with kids, I've definitely gotten more playful and more curious maybe. But then the art handling, um, I think for me, like, I mean, there's, there's probably a long list of examples of the way that it's um, informed my work. But um, I think one way is you spend a long time with objects in a space. So spending like two weeks in a gallery with the same objects, like you really get the subtle, you start to really get a subtle long relationship with it. Um, so that just, it develops just that brain. Um, of, of looking and, and seeing deeply, yeah. You know. And being with something for way longer than you normally would if you're just seeing an exhibition. Yeah, yeah just, just spending that much time around something is gonna inevitably just be one of the many experiences that affects you know, your work. And I know it's definitely become part of the language um, of presentation that I use and, um, and building uh, a narrative is you know, something that I look to museum and artifacts as, uh, you know, the strategies that they employ, even the materials they employ. I'm always uh, amazed how like certain materials like wood and plexiglass, you know, can just, once, it, once something's inside of them, it can suddenly mythologize it. Yeah, no, it's very, very interesting. I, I must say that for me, one of the, you know, my most favorite times of, uh, or my favorite aspects of my job as on the curatorial side of things is, is the installation. And I'm always very nervous when I begin thinking, oh my God, how are we gonna make all these things, you know, come together and be happy in the same space. And so it's really interesting, you know, watching how much, you know, objects can change when you change their location and how much interaction there is with the space and the, and the works around them. Absolutely. And, you know, Lynn, I've learned a lot of that from you, from like working with you, because, you know, we, we like you're saying, the, the gallery, when it's empty, it becomes this compositional space. So the whole space is a compositional space. So we're kind of, in whatever we want to call it, we sort of put on our artist brains of like, well, where do things go? And what's, what's the meaning? How does meaning change when we rearrange things in space? Because you have the meaning of the object or whatever the content is of the work, but then there's a whole nother content or a whole nother context. And like the, so the subtlety of it is something I've definitely learned from you because you can look across like a 30, you know, like 30 feet to a wall. And if like you want to move something a half inch and it makes a difference. Yeah, no, it does. It's fun. It does. It's, I mean, you, you're like, nah, it doesn't matter. You're like, no, that did it. And you know it. And then, so, and then it also becomes like, in, there's an intu intuition that gets built over time. You're like, yep, that's it. And so like trusting that intuition has really been like a part of making artwork for me. It's like, oh yeah, that's it. Just a little bit to the left. <laughs> yeah, and the gray is like an interesting place because they'll show artwork, but they'll also show ephemera and, and, and it'll be not, it'll be about uh, communicating a certain time period or a certain environment. Um, and that becomes a, you know, there's a certain strategy to arranging objects there. Yes, and different narratives that come in, and, mm -hmm. you know, that recalling of time and space and the layering um, and the, the different ways that a document can, or a letter of an artist, if we're showing the letter, can inform, you know, the work of art. So it is nice to get those relationships going. Totally. We have some good questions from the audience. Um, so one is, um, it seems like you both create cosmologies of symbols that are imbued with meaning in a way that you place them. I'm wondering if you can talk more about the role of spatial relationships to mod modularity and narrative in your installations. I think we've touched on some of that, but any, either of you want to address that? Um, I'm sort of absorbing all the parts of that question. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it again. Okay. 
cosmology, and you both create cosmologies of symbols that are imbued with meaning in the way that you place them. And do you want to talk more about the role of spatial relationships to modularity well, and narrative? I'll, I'll say that, that when a lot of the installation process for, for my work is, um, it's about just moving things and arranging them and seeing how the proximity to each other really affects uh, them. So every, every installation, you know, creates sort of a different idea to chase or a different part of that narrative you can kind of think of. I mean, not, not everyone's seeing that, narr that exact narrative that I'm seeing, but hopefully there's, you know, with, this, with, this, with visual language like that, it's not like la in regular language or, or spoken or written language. It's not a pistol that you're aiming at with, your, it's a, a shotgun blast, you know, of like information. So you just kind of aim in the direction that you want and hope that putting these things next to it gets, gets close. Yeah, um, for me, the idea of spatial relationships, spatial relation, it's, again, it's kind of everything because it's like, for me, like uh, if you're working even with two, I mean, I don't think, what am I trying to say? Sorry. Even stuff that appears to be two dimensional in my work, it, the, the framed photographs of the prints, they're still three dimensional objects. They're objects in space. And so there's these three elements. There's the two elements that we talked about of like the space that something exists in what the thing is itself embedded in that object. But then there's a third, there's a third element that makes it all come together and that's the body moving through that space. So the body of the viewer. And so um, that to me is like where everything comes together. And so when I think about like my installations or think about my shows, um, I think about like, well, what are the potential ways or what is the suggested way or how do I control sort of movement through the space? And then how do I want that experience to unfold? It doesn't mean that it always works out that way or that it has to be very tight or very rigid or there's only one sort of answer. But it, and it comes back again to this idea of like exhibition design. You know, it's like exhibition design, you're creating an experience that has a narrative that you move through and it, the, the, there's some tangents and, and different directions you can go in, but there's meaning embedded in how you move through space. And so that's, so the like location of things sort of matters, but it only matters in relationship to the, to the space itself and then, and then the body. And to me, that's sort of the three things that come together. Sure, no, it makes sense. We have another interesting question. Um, found objects and found concepts that you find and make is your intent to blur the line between found objects and found concepts? I don't know the difference between a found object and a found <laughs> concept. <laughs> uh, I oh, think they're found. one. No, I think they're one. In, uh, is it my intent to blur lines? Definitely. Why? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I guess because as an artist, like there's some sort of, um, there's some fiction involved, so. And, and, and where the blurring of the lines, I guess to me where the blurring of the lines is maybe when I like, if I can, I like to show that there's just a little crack in that blurred line. So when the viewer gets into that space of like, oh, the lines are starting to blur, that's where it, when it kind of becomes a little disorienting is kind of where it gets interesting mm -hmm. for me. You kind of start to fall into the rabbit hole that takes you into these different associations. Or you, and also with this idea of found, something's found, you're like, oh, they found that, that's a real thing. And then it's like, oh, is it, did they make it? Is it real? You know, and it starts to like this, question our ideas about like the authenticity of something. And, and, and working in a way like using photocopies, like those, those flyers that I have on those big collages, like it's a photocopy, but is it the real photocopy? I and mean, when does it, it sort of ceases to matter. And so you, the, our, our, our ability to see something as the real thing, but then lose all necessity of have that be true or not, doesn't matter. Joseph, found concepts, found objects? Any thoughts? Well, I, I guess that, you know, all found objects have some sort of found concept already kind of imbu imbued with them. But I guess with when I've been working on this, this work, um, a lot of the uh, finding the concepts first, maybe through like just tangential research, you know, not, not like academic research, but just kind of like going from one thing to the next and then creating objects that 
um, act as artifacts or containers for those. Um, and there's some time, there are some times when I do try to confuse um, that line, I guess like those plasticine uh, stone structures where, the, uh, where I am trying to talk about something that's made that looks like something found, um, imposing like the concept onto the artifact. Yeah, no, lots of layers in both your work, um, which of course makes it interesting. Um, uh, and along this line, I mean, I think, you know, again, a, a, a unifying um, aspect um, in your approach, we talked about it a little bit earlier in terms of bricolar, but is uh, and bricolor and bricolage, the person who, who makes, um, works with all these various objects to create something new is also, you know, kind of in a very, basic form, a type of collage. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always been fascinated how important collage was to artists in the early 20th century and how far it's come, you know, where it's extended out into space and into installation and three dimensions. So that's, you know, again, this concept of um, responding to a space and creating a sculpture that is both modular and adapting and, and in dialogue. Um, with the space um, mm -hmm. seems really interesting. Any thoughts on that further or? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking sort of for the first time, but this idea of sort of working and I feel like maybe Joseph's work sp speaks to this maybe even more clearly, but like a three dimensional collage is kind of an interesting idea, you know, because mo most of the time the, the, the thought of a collage is it's two dimensional. So then what happens if you're making a collage out into space. Yeah. Um, so there was um, a um, another question here that um, suggests our comments. Both of your works, both of your works, somehow remind me of hyperlinks in a digital place coming out of a physical <laughs> form. <laughs> Any thoughts on the relationship between physicality and hyperlinks in your work? You know, I would, that's funny because I had a studio visit when I was building that installation and I was told um, that my work looks like a model of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a, hand, a handmade model of the internet. And I thought, well, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's very interesting, but maybe it's more like, it would be more like a handmade uh, model of an internet search or like, a, like, the, like we have all the windows of tabs, you know, one thing links to the next and then it leads to another uh, idea. And then you, you have this, you know, by the time you're done, uh, you have all these windows open, you know, that, that shows the, all the, the different um, circuitous route you took through, through traveling through these topics. Um, and that's what it feels like uh, to me. A lot, a lot of unanswered, unanswered questions. You know, I, I told you that the narrative gets messier and messier. Yes. Um, well, the, more, would... the more windows you open, yes. the more tabs you have. <laughs> yeah, you never go back, or you, sometimes you go back, but you, then you don't forget which ones you're interested in, or it's get that scattered, the scattered sensation that, of 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 the digital era, you know. Sure, know that feeling, Ruben. <laughs> well, um, it's interesting. I'm curious. We may not get this answer, but I'm curious what reminds them of hyperlinks in the in the digital place. That's a good. It's a curious question. Um, and I feel it like from what Joseph just said too. Um, in some of those collages, I actually have Q scannable QR codes in them. So if you have a smartphone that can scan a QR code, uh, you can open up using those collages, you can open up into actual digital territory. That's so interesting, that's like great. A, kind of a, it was almost like more than I could t handle or take on because it just, <laughs> op it's like it just uh -oh. is like, oh my God, it's just gonna open up into like so much. But so it was like scratching that surface of that possibility. And so there was other content. There's other content to those, to those collages that don't exist in the collage, which, that, can, that can exist in just these series of squares in this pattern, which to me was fascinating. Um, and, it, and to me, it kind of speaks to this idea of found concepts and found objects that like the internet is like this a whole set of like found concepts in, in, in some sort of varying degrees of graphic design. Um, and that you could, and, the, and to me, there was this analogy between, I have all these found flyers. And so these are like these, it's like a very low tech, like building of websites. You can take these, you can make a flyer very cheaply 
and you can just put it out in the world. You can publish a website and it doesn't matter like what your ideas are, but the container is sort of leveled more or less. Um, and so it's this leveling it to me and that's a really interest. This is like a very tangential concept, but like this leveling of the container. Like what happens when to, to what happens when you level a container when like everything is on a website like this idea of like fact and fiction and we're seeing that play out now you know and we're getting more used to it the more yeah, we... and we're getting more used to it and so to me like photocopying is sort of this like leveling container or like eight and a half by 11 is a leveling container so I, i'm sorry i don't know i'm going this but but no no yeah. it makes sense yes, it's related it's yeah now it's like totally different. related yeah. in terms of the hyperlinks and forms yeah. Yeah. all right so we're about to close one of the um we're almost at our full hour but one viewer also ha was thinking along the same lines as i was earlier in terms about uh can you talk more about your sculptural works and your experience as art handlers in terms of thinking how people may move around your work and see them from different perspectives so i think uh ruben you had addressed that a little bit in terms of installing any other final comments or observations before we, we we close in relationship to that question yep anything about you know in terms of art handlers and moving th around the viewers um, to see from different angles i mean i felt i yeah i feel like i kind of yeah like i covered it the, just this idea of like people moving through space and then as an art handler just spending a lot of time in space in spaces that are meant for art to be in which has by our, by the traditions of our culture has specific a specific feeling yeah i think i think maybe like one advantage of, of having done that this art you know art handling and placing things that you become very attuned to this to the nuances of placement mm -hmm. Yeah, you, yeah, Ruben um, hinted at that as well, or suggest not hinted, but mentioned yeah. specifically mm -hmm. half an inch makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, yeah, it's just it's it's recognizing. I think for me, the big thing is recognizing the space where the artwork exists and people interact and people view it, interact with it, experience it. That's a compositional space, as much as like a frame, a frame or a drawing, a piece of drawing paper, or an object. No, I think you're right. And I'll, I think we can, I want to thank you both. This has been really fun and you're illuminating welcome. and really yeah. great to see your work. Um, I think that um, one, one thing that strikes me and I, I, I would imagine you have the same um, side effect. I'm trying to think of the word that I wanted to use, but the, um, a downside of, of our jobs in terms of installing art is that we go into an exhibition and I immediately start to critique the installation and <laughs> notice if something's crooked or <laughs> lighting is off or I don't like yeah. the color of the wall. I mean, I'm sure you guys notice that as well. You do get a sharp eye by doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that, sometimes that sharp eye can turn into a judgmental eye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you're not careful. Joseph? <laughs> Yeah, especially lighting now. This is something I'm, I'm more uh, sensitive to than, than ever before. All right. Well, thank you both. Um, thank I you. Wanna, thank I want to thank our thank viewers you. for some really great questions. Um, I want to remind everybody that this will go online eventually with closed captions and to also peruse and enjoy and look at some of our other programs. And so goodbye for now. Um, we're looking forward to when we reopen um, to having live people um, in the gallery, interacting, moving around. Um, but meanwhile, it's great to see you uh, virtually um, and look forward again to meeting in real time in real space. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.